There's a saying that goes, low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere. I think that's a great saying. I'm of the opinion that the biggest obstacle to becoming a spacefaring civilization is just heaving stuff off the Earth in the first place. Once we're in space, it's all plain sailing, but the annoying part is once we're in space, we're usually out of fuel. This is why we really need some good infrastructure in space, preferably mined from a giant ball of nearby resources. Yes, Moon, I'm looking at you. Inhospitable, my ass, get the f over here. So I think that the idea that low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere is actually pretty accurate, and it's a really cool way to think about space travel, although I think it needs a few asterisks next to it, so let me begin by taking that statement down a couple of notches. First off, low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere in the solar system. It's not halfway to Alpha Centauri or the Andromeda Galaxy, let's not get crazy. This statement also isn't universally true for everything in the solar system. I know I'm not filling you with confidence that this is indeed a great saying, but you know, just bear with me. It's still more or less true to say that low Earth orbit is about halfway, or even more than halfway, to a lot of places in the solar system, specifically a lot of the places you'd most want to go, and that the half you still need to do from low Earth orbit onwards is usually a smooth downhill ride compared to the diarrhea-infused roller coaster that is getting to low Earth orbit in the first place. But wait, I hear you say, how is low Earth orbit halfway to anywhere when low Earth orbit is, by definition, an orbit less than 2,000 kilometers in altitude versus the 385,000 kilometer distance to the moon and at least tens of millions of kilometers to anywhere else? Well, my little sh** weasel, the moon and the planets may be far away, but just being far away doesn't necessarily mean they're difficult to get to. All right, let's do a thought experiment. Let's say there's an object floating in empty space, completely stationary relative to you, but it's 100 kilometers away. You're also floating stationary in empty space. There's nothing between you and the object, nor is there anything nearby that could interfere with the thought experiment. Let's say you want to transport yourself to that floating object. You're very motivated to get there. Imagine something that would motivate you. I'm imagining the object is a happy dog balancing a stack of pancakes on his head. The question is, would you need a lot of energy to get there? Well, not necessarily. If you have any way of producing a tiny amount of thrust, even just for an instant, if you point that thrust in the right direction, you will be able to get there. Space is frictionless. It's not like a car that needs constant energy input to keep moving. In space, you gently drift forever. The difficult part is getting over to a floating object if that object is also moving relative to you. If the object wasn't stationary and instead was moving away from you at one meter per second, then if you only have the ability to get yourself moving at half a meter per second, then you will never get there. Yeah, you'll drift forever towards it, but it will drift away, and every second you spend traveling, the distance between you and it will still be increasing by half a meter. In other words, you will still drift apart forever. To get to the object, you need to accelerate to one meter per second to match its velocity, and then any velocity you can give yourself on top of that will actually get you closer. So while it's technically true you could throw an object across a gap the size of the universe if you just want it to hit a stationary target on the other side, stationary relative to you, in reality, to get somewhere, usually there's a minimum velocity that you need to hit. This is called the delta V. Delta meaning a change in something, and V meaning velocity. Delta V is the change in velocity you need to get somewhere. In our imagined scenario, the delta V you need to get there is just over one meter per second. This scenario is vaguely analogous to getting to other places in the solar system. There's a few caveats though, the biggest one being the presence of gravity. I'm gay. <laughs> If you want to get off of Earth, gravity is kind of like a treadmill that constantly wants to move you downwards. Think of gravity like space-time being pulled into the surface of a celestial body, and to move against it, it's like running on a treadmill. You have to run on a treadmill at a certain speed just to not go backwards. Going backwards on the treadmill is like gravity pressing you into the floor. Now if you imagine a helicopter that's on top of a giant weighing scale, and you let the helicopter spin up its rotor blades faster and faster, the weighing scale will show the helicopter getting lighter and lighter, and when it weighs nothing, that means that the energy being put into the rotors and directed downwards is perfectly counteracting the force of gravity, which is like running on the treadmill and matching the speed perfectly to remain stationary. If the helicopter's in the air already, producing this amount of force allows it to hover. So, in reality, a huge amount of the energy that a flying machine uses is just counteracting the pull of gravity, it's not actually being used to move anywhere. The energy you use on top of counteracting gravity is the energy that actually gets you places. Where the treadmill analogy breaks down a little bit is that a treadmill wants to move you back at a set speed, whereas gravity provides an acceleration. A treadmill might want to move you back at, say, 10 meters per second, which that would be a very fast treadmill, goddamn. But the gravitational acceleration of Earth is about 10 meters per second per second. 
second. So gravity wants to accelerate you downwards an additional 10 meters per second for every second that you're in the air. So if you're hovering in the air and suddenly stop hovering, if you're in that helicopter and your rotor blades just stop spinning instantly for some reason, you could start with a vertical speed of 0 meters per second, and one second later you'll be moving at 10 meters per second, and the second after that you'll be moving at 20 meters per second, and the second after that you'll be moving at 30 meters per second, and so on. It's this acceleration that you have to counteract to fly in reality, and it gobbles up a gigantic amount of energy, for example, at liftoff, the SpaceX Starship uses the vast majority of its engines just to counteract gravity. More than 20 of these engines are kind of not really being used to go anywhere. It's the few engines that it has on top of the critical number that cancels out its weight that are the ones that actually allow it to move upwards. This whole situation is sometimes referred to as gravity drag, because to get to space, you're losing energy battling the atmosphere on a second-by-second -second basis, which creates atmospheric drag, and you're also losing energy by dumping it into running away from the Earth's gravity well on a second by second basis, so that's gravity drag. You need to be moving at about 7,800 meters per second to be in a circular orbit around the Earth at an altitude of 250 kilometers. We can think of this as our target delta V from our earlier thought experiment. It's kind of like we're trying to catch up to something, it's just the thing that we're catching up to is the ability to move fast enough for the Earth to drop away from us at the same speed we're falling over it. Now bear in mind, we'll have to tack on some extra velocity needed to fight gravity drag and atmospheric drag and just velocity spent on gaining enough altitude to clear the atmosphere, so the actual delta V capability that our rocket will need will be higher. The exact value needed kind of varies from rocket to rocket because the more powerful your engines are, the more quickly you can accelerate into space, meaning that you waste less of your time having to counteract gravity. Like every second you're fighting the gravity well, you lose 10 meters per second of velocity per second just fighting it, so you want to get out of the gravity well as quick as possible. But at the same time, usually the more powerful an engine, the less efficient it is, so there's kind of a balancing act to be done there. The optimal solution for a multi-stage rocket is typically one where you put the biggest, most powerful, least efficient engines on the bottom stage and progressively get less powerful but more efficient the further up the staging you go. There's a couple of nice things about getting into orbit. One, an orbit is stable, so you can gather your thoughts and change your diaper. And two, if you want to go anywhere, you can now speed up in the sideways direction that you're already traveling in and not dump even more energy into fighting gravity on a second-by-second -second basis. And from orbit, if we use our fuel as efficiently as possible and wait for the right planetary alignments to make certain journeys, we can estimate more or less how much of a change in speed is needed to get anywhere really accurately. In fact, it's easier to estimate the interplanetary part of our journey because there's a lot fewer variables there than there are getting into low Earth orbit. We don't need to account for drag or anything like that, and different spaceships will still need the same amount of delta V to get wherever. So we can make a delta V map of the entire solar system to show how hard it is to get from any planet to any other planet. Here's one that someone made earlier. Kind of looks like a subway map. Reminds me of traveling in Glasgow, only less dangerous. We can use this map to vaguely guesstimate how accurate the idea is that low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere. So now you know the context, we can check out this map and see how accurate that statement actually is. Now, straight up, there are a couple of caveats to the map. I'm full of fucking caveats today. First off, the delta V requirements to do things in space are generally reversible. So if it takes some amount of delta V to go from one trajectory to another, it usually takes about the same amount to go from the end one back to the starting one. So if you want to go from low Earth orbit to low lunar orbit, it will take about the same amount of delta V to do that as going from low lunar orbit to low Earth orbit. Those two maneuvers should cost basically exactly the same amount. But there is the edge case, which is when you're getting onto and off planets with atmospheres, since you don't strictly need to do all the work to get onto a planet with an atmosphere that you need to do to get off of that planet. If you want to get onto a planet with an atmosphere, you can just get into a low orbit and then alter your velocity by a very small amount just until the spacecraft starts touching the atmosphere and then just air brake your way down onto the planet, like glide or use parachutes or whatever. But when you're launching from that same planet, you have to do all of the work to get into orbit. These two things aren't reversible, so this map doesn't take account of that and it just shows the values for taking off. So on this map, landings look potentially costlier than they actually are. You can also save some delta V by integrating some of these maneuvers into one maneuver where possible, like this map splits up maneuvers in ways which you could potentially amalgamate in real life to allow you to do it more efficiently. So basically, the values that you see on this map are potentially a little bit artificially inflated. We'll just try and take account of it, it's no big deal. Anyways, now we know what we need to know in order to look at the map and know what we're talking about. So to go from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit, we'll need about 9,400 meters per second of delta V. This includes the roughly 7,800 meters per second you need to actually be traveling at to be in a circular orbit at an altitude of 250 kilometers, plus about 1,600 meters per second spent on gaining enough altitude, fighting gravity, and fighting the atmosphere. So 9,400 meters per second is the delta V spent on getting from Earth 
to low Earth orbit. 9400 is the number to keep in mind. That's the one we're comparing everything else to. If the value from low Earth orbit to landing on other planets is usually less than 9400, then the saying is accurate. If the value from low Earth orbit to landing on other planets is higher than 9400, then the saying is a bunch of dirty barnacles, okay? All right, here we go. So if you add up all the values between low Earth orbit and the surface of the moon, then you'll find that low Earth orbit is actually more than halfway to the moon. It's more like three fifths of the way there, which is pretty cool. From low Earth orbit to Mars is 9,510. But bear in mind, this is a planet that you can aero break onto. Believe it or not, if you account for combining maneuvers where possible and aero breaking onto this planet, not only is low Earth orbit more than halfway to the surface of Mars, but landing on Mars is actually easier than landing on the moon from a Delta V perspective. From a logistics perspective, getting living humans to Mars is a nightmare. It'll still take you over eight months to arrive and you'll have to wait for the planets to align again before you can get back. But specifically from a fuel perspective, and this is true, I swear to God, I'm not making this up to f*** with you, it's actually easier to get to Mars than it is to get to the moon. That's wild. All right, let's check out the outer solar system. From low Earth orbit to Jupiter, it, well, it might be better to just do Jupiter's moons, unless you're just looking for a very long-winded, very expensive way to kill yourself. From low Earth orbit to Callisto, which is the outermost of Jupiter's big moons, is 13,500. 540, and to Io, which is Jupiter's innermost big moon, is 19,470. So yeah, you have to be planning a trip out to Jupiter before a journey from Earth means that the getting there part will be more costly than the just getting into space in the first place part. Something even crazier is that if you go from low Earth orbit to Titan, which is Saturn's moon, which is further out than Jupiter is, while it'll hypothetically cost you 19,030 meters per second of delta V, Titan is another place that you can aero break onto. If Titan is not short of something, it is gas. And the error breaking value to Titan is closer to 11,430, which means from low Earth orbit, you really are almost halfway to Saturn's moon Titan. That's insane. In fact, it's easier to get to Titan, all things considered, than it is to do most things in the Jupiter planetary system. And then finally, I'll just kind of throw Neptune in there. If you want to get to Neptune orbit, that's 15,350, just to give some perspective on a really far away thing. This is still significantly less than the value to Jupiter's moon Io, but that's because the 19,470 value onto Io is onto the surface of Io, meaning you've got to break onto the surface with your rocket engine, and then you've got gravity drag losses and all that kind of stuff. So that's why you can theoretically get out to Neptune orbit for less less than it costs to just land on Io. Now, I've left a couple of weird, unexpected little details at the end here in the form of Venus and Mercury. You might be aware that the further out into the solar system you go, the more spread out the planets tend to be. Conversely, everything's a lot more crunched up on itself the further in that you go. Now, conventional wisdom might tell you that it would therefore be the easiest to get to Venus since, of all the planets, Venus is the closest to Earth at its closest approach. But since the orbits need to be a lot faster the closer to a gravitational source they get, Venus, and especially Mercury, are really booking it around the sun very quickly, which makes them actually very hard to get to, much harder than you might imagine. The delta V from low Earth orbit to Venus is 33,790, although this isn't really true. The huge delta V requirement here is totally because of how wild Venus's atmosphere is. Venus's atmosphere isn't even a gas at its surface. The pressure is so high, it literally becomes a thing called a supercritical fluid. When you're launching from the surface, pushing all of that out of the way, as well as getting out of its basically Earth strength gravity well, is crazy difficult, and that's the value that it's showing here. So the actual value will be closer to 6,790, which is a lot more reasonable, but still more difficult to get to than Mars, which people might be slightly surprised by. But low Earth orbit to Mercury is 16,140, and that one really is accurate. Mercury orbits fast. It's one of the biggest pains in the asses to get to in the entire solar system, despite, again, in the grand scheme of things, being pretty close to the Earth. Hilariously, the Earth is orbiting the Sun at about 30,000 meters per second, which is so fast it takes less delta to be to leave the solar system entirely than it does to just get to the sun, provided you're doing a single maneuver from Earth and falling in. I know all the KSP players are going to be like, oh, I know how you can do it more efficiently. I know, I know, it's fine. I know, it's cool. Just chill, just chill, just chill. So the final verdict, does this saying hold up? Um, yeah, I guess. Kind of depends what you're looking for, really. But uh, yeah, I'd basically say so. On that note, like and subscribe if you want to, and I'll catch you in the next one. Over and out.